There is nothing we won't try. Okay, here we go. The word impossible this time. There's no stopping us. Put it out. Is she yours? No, I'm... Your mother said she found it in your closet. I don't know. One of the guys was... Lost the what? Look, Dad, it's Where not... Where did you get it? Dad, Answer it's... me. Who taught you how to do this stuff? You are right. I learned it by watching you. Parents who listen to Dune Steef have children who listen to Dune Steef. Please, help stop Dune Steef today. Thank you for listening to the Dune Steef Audio Fiction Magazine. And now here's your host, Rish Outfield. Forgive my rudeness. I cannot abide useless people. And Big Anklevich. How did your brain even learn human speech? I'm just so curious. Welcome, everybody. Catastrophe Baker. Oh, boy. Welcome. Yes. To the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. Episode 121. Cool. I am your host, Rish Outfield. And I'm the other host, Big Anklevich. And in the corner. What? Fondling his pipe, so to speak. <laughs> announcer man. Don't all your friends smoke pipes? No, actually. No. Do, do any of your friends smoke pipes, Big? I don't know that I've ever known a single person aside from announcer man that smokes a pipe, actually. So, no. Am I the only one? It could be worse. It could be cigars. Yeah, or skin flutes. Don't go there. Actually, I have known people. <laughs> but, uh, well, hey, Happy New Year, everybody. What do we have as our special year-end baby New Year treat? Uh, oh, it's part three of our ongoing series of The Adventures of Catastrophe Baker. By Mike Bisnick. That's right. The man Wait, am I needs- allowed to do that silly voice when I say his name? Do we have clearance from Mike Resnick to use silly voices? I think he did sign over that waiver, so we should be okay. Okay. Bye. Mike Resnick. Ah, that was cream of the crop. Now, you could say this man needs no introduction because he's been on the show a lot of times. He's been in other shows. He's got stories coming out his ears. And he's got more Hugo nominations than you. No matter who you are. (laughs) There you go. (laughs) You could be Batman listening to this episode. You don't have as many Hugo nominations. You could be the director of the movie Hugo. (laughs) You haven't got as much Hugo as Mike Resnick's got. Or back hair. I'm sorry. Maybe we should move along to the story now. Uh, Another great story coming at you. Mike Resnick's been on the show a few times before. He... Oh, well, heck, he's, he's even got Parsec nominations for that matter, because the first time we did a story with Mike Resnick, it was our nomination for the Parsec that year, and that was a great story. And we've done two other Catastrophe Baker stories, so if you enjoy this one and you haven't heard the others, then go back and check them out, because A, you can listen to them in any order, so it would be fine to go back and check them out, and B, these are funny stories. Uh, Mike Resnick is kind of more known as a tearjerker writer. That's close to what I'm known as. Yeah, but just... we know. But yeah, he, he writes some pretty funny stuff, and I think this one is no exception. So check this out. It was produced by Tobias Queen, and he did a bang-up job. Am I allowed to say bang-up? We got him to sign that waiver too, right? Oh, shoot. It's not there. We better say something else. Oh, crap. Okay. He did a bang-up job. Whoa, whoa. Wait, that actually is okay. Oh, all right. So enjoy the story, folks. See ya on the other side. Catastrophe Baker Makes First Contact by Mike Resnick. I was standing at the bar in the outpost, the best drinking hole in the Plantagenet system, minding my own business and admiring some of the ladies who were in attendance, when my old pal Hurricane Smith rushed into the place, looked around, spotted me, and raced up to the bar. Hi, Catastrophe. 
I was hoping I'd find you here. If it's about that 50 credits I owe you, I began. Forget that. How'd you like to make some real money? I eyed him kind of suspiciously, because even though we were both members in good standing of the hero trade, the hurricane ain't never been much for sharing. What do you have in mind, I asked. The Navy's busy fighting four or five wars at once, as usual. And someone just reported a ship of unknown origin and design out by the Leinster system. And they hired me to go out and, how'd they put it, determine its intentions. And if its intentions are hostile? I'm to blow them to smithereens, of course. Well, that hardly sounds like a two-man job. Especially for men like us, I said. Well, it isn't, he admitted. He looked kind of uncomfortable. And I waited for him to continue. I've got to get over to Driscoll 3. You see, there's this girl. Girl? I repeated dubiously. Well, female. And it could take a couple of days to kill a whole shipload of evil aliens and... Well... You fell in love with another lady insect, I concluded. She ain't no insect. Well, not exactly. I shook my head sadly. Do you know how often your taste in exotic lady friends has gotten you into trouble over the years? Well, this one's different, he swore. I can believe that, I told him. So, will you do it? What's the job pay, I asked. 5,000 credits. Well, uh, 4,500. I want a little something for throwing it your way. I tell you what, don't charge me 500 for getting me the job. And I won't charge you 500 for letting you out of it so you can canoodle with your lady lobster or whatever the hell she is. Mm-hmm. He drew himself up to his full height, which is only an inch or two below my six foot nine, and said with all the dignity he could muster, You are talking about the female that I temporarily love. I thought we were talking about the potentially evil aliens you wanted to duck so you could spend more time with your six-legged heartthrob. Four, he corrected me. My mistake. He checked his timepiece. Okay, 5,000. I can't keep her waiting any longer, but you can pick up the ship at the hangar. What's wrong with my own ship, I asked. This one's armed with pulse and laser cannons, energy torpedoes, everything you need to blow these alien swine out of the ether. And the love of your life doesn't mind expressions like that? No member of her race resembles a pig in any way. Well, except maybe around the nose. And, all right, they, they, they got the, the, the tail that kind of does the, the corkscrew thing. But that's, and, and the hooves. But, but you know, it, it, it's a whole, okay, they kind of, the eyes are on the side there, like the way that the, the, the pigs might be. But, but lots of animals are like that. And people, too. Well, not people. Poor sign. I left species. him there enumerating all the ways his lady friend hardly resembled a barn animal and went off to save the galaxy once again. I picked up the ship, told the computer to head to the Leinster system, wherever the hell that was, and checked in with the Navy to make sure of my instructions. A hologram of a good looking girl popped into existence. Well, she would have been good looking if she hadn't been in one of those shapeless uniforms. So I told her who I was and that I was replacing Hurricane Smith and asked what my orders were. Catastrophe Biker? <laughs> I've heard of you. You're an even bigger hero than Hurricane Smith and Grave Digger Gangs. Especially where it counts, I answered, giving her my number three smile. Did Mr. Smith tell you about the ship? I think his exact words were, you can pick up the ship at the hangar. It has eight energy torpedoes, two pulse cannons, a laser cannon, and a beautifully camouflaged self-destruct button. I have to press it? Yes. Now why would I do that while I'm still in the ship? I'm not responsible for design flaws. Okay, I said. Is there anything else I should know? The ship is powered by a solar sail. Thanks. You're welcome. Wow. 
catastrophe baker himself. <laughs> if you ever come to Branston too, I'm on the southern continent. We have the most beautiful sunsets. Yeah, I said. Maybe I'll stop by as a reward for killing all these alien scum and saving the human race again. The hologram vanished, and I walked around the ship to make sure I knew where all the weaponry was. Finally, I finished and just plopped down on the captain's chair. Oof! Who's that? I demanded, looking around for stowaways. Me. Advance, me, and be recognized. You're sitting on me. You're the chair? I said, surprised. I'm the whole ship. My, but you're brawny. Now... Man and boy, I've been irresistible to women since I was ten years old, but I couldn't see where being irresistible to a lady spaceship could lead to anything but an amusing story or two the next time I was at the outpost. So I decided to keep our relationship on a business-like basis. So, how far are we from the Leinster system, I asked. Do you want the answer in parsecs, miles, or traveling time, handsome? Uh, traveling time, I said, jumping up when the arms of the chair started wrapping themselves around me. Seven hours and three minutes, big boy. Thanks, I said, wondering if I was going to have to stand for the whole seven hours. Do you know what we can do in seven hours? I don't even want to think about it. Your friend Hurricane couldn't wait. My friend Hurricane's got a thing for relationships that are beyond the scope of God, man, and nature. <laughs> the whole ship shuddered as it gave voice to a deafening sob. Go ahead, insult me. Break my heart. See if I care. <laughs> I'm sorry, ship. Ship? <laughs> you call me ship as if I'm just a thing. You... Are just a thing, I replied. <laughs> All right, I said at last. What should I call you? Bubbles. Fine, I said. I apologize, Bubbles. And you'll never insult me again. And I'll never insult you again. And we'll be together forever and ever. Don't go getting ahead of yourself, ship. <laughs> I, I, I meant bubbles. Now, I know you've got this irresistible urge to run whatever the hell it is that passes for your hands all over me, but I gotta be fresh when I face the evil alien killers from hell. They're from Line Star 4. Well, there too, I agreed, walking over and sitting on the chair. I was asleep two minutes later, and I felt totally refreshed when I woke up. I stood up, stretched, and walked over to one of the holographic view screens. Are we getting close? I feel sharp. I must have slept five, maybe six hours. You slept for ten hours and twenty-three minutes. We're there then, I said, looking for signs of the enemy. We're an hour away. I thought we were seven hours away before I took a ten-hour nap. We've lost all motive power and are stopped dead in space. I went to her engine room and began opening everything I could find while she squealed like a schoolgirl with each thing I opened and kept begging me to do it again. Finally, I went back to the bridge, frowning in puzzlement. Bubbles, I don't know how to tell you this, but you ain't got no solar cells. Of course not. So we're stranded here? It'll be so cozy, so intimate. There's a ship full of mad dog killers out there. I have to stop them from whatever their foul purpose is. Good luck. In the meantime, do you play gin rummy? I don't believe you understand the gravity of our situation. Would you like me to make it lighter? Maybe 93% of Earth normal? I'm clearly not getting through to you. Patch me through to headquarters. Maybe they can tell me how to get us moving again. Oh, all right. I can see you're determined. You're very manly when you're determined. Did you know that? Just patch me through. I don't have to. Of course you do. I'm the captain. 
I mean, I know why we've stopped moving. The solar cell went dead? I don't have a solar cell. I have a solar sail. But the girl said... She had an accent. Well, she did say she came from the southern continent. Okay, tell me about solar sails. Do we wait for a solar wind to come up, or have you got oars for when everything's still? We create our own wind. Just a minute. If you think I'm going to stand on your hull and blow at the sail... Oh, I love it when you're being forceful. And when they're as big and good-looking as you, a brain would be an unnecessary encumbrance. All right. How do we make you move? Whenever I'm close to a star, I use its radiation pressure to propel me. And when you ain't? I've got a very powerful laser on my hull, and it pushes the big ultra-thin mirrors in the sail to light speeds. Damn, I saw that laser when I climbed aboard. I should have known they wouldn't give you pulse and laser cannons. I'll just climb into a spacesuit and see what's wrong there. I was afraid she was going to comment when I doffed my duds and climbed into the suit, but all she did was whistle and then sigh a lot. And a minute or two later, I was walking across the hull with my magnetic boots. I came to the laser and saw that it didn't have no power. I checked the battery, and its casing had been hit by some kind of space debris and was so misshapen that I couldn't pull the damn battery out. And that meant I couldn't fix it. So I did the only thing I could do. I sat down cross-legged on the hull, pulled my laser pistol out, and it was damn chilly unzipping the suit long enough to get it. And then I just took target practice on the sail. Ouch! How come you didn't say ouch when a much bigger laser was firing into your sail, I demanded. It didn't have a sense of guilt. Well, I got that in common with it, I said as Bubbles reached light speed. And no matter what Bubbles told the press about my inserting a spare battery, she just loved that word, insert. This is how we got to Leinster, and heroes hardly ever lie or exaggerate, except when necessary. And it was when she told me that we were just beyond the outer planet of the system that I finally saw the enemy ship. I realized right away that they were our scientific superiors, because they didn't have no evil black-hearted genocidal aliens sitting on the hull of their ship firing his burner into a solar sail. Who are you? Demanded a voice inside my helmet that I knew right away didn't belong to Bubbles, since it was about six octaves lower and had a Leinsterian accent. Well, I assume it was Leinsterian, but it could have been French. Answer me. Who are you? I'm Catastrophe Baker, here to determine your intentions and possibly put an end to them, depending. Catastrophe Baker? Your reputation precedes you. Good. I hate things sneaking up behind me, including godless aliens with hostile intentions. Our intentions are entirely peaceful. Unless we're provoked, of course. What does it take to provoke you? Just keep being pugnacious. That'll do it. Okay, enough of this polite chit-chat. I challenge your hero to a battle to the death, mano a mano. We agree. Then it paused, and I could hear someone or something whispering to it. There is one condition. Yeah? What is it? Our hero objects to being called a mano. All right. Mano a godless thingo, I answered. Deal. We'll meet on Jenkins. Where the hell's that? Our seventh planet. Do it. It's an oxygen world with normal gravity. Normal for what? For manly men. Oh, I'm going to enjoy watching this. I used up the last of my laser's power getting us to Jenkins, and we sat down right next to the alien ship. Their hatch opened, and out came something with more than a few arms and legs, and a lot of teeth, and not much hair. 
and a minute later out came an even bigger virgin, just about as tall and broad as me, but of course nowhere near as good looking. We must discuss the ground rules, said the littler one. There ain't no ground rules in a biting and stomping wrestling match to the death. Okay, said the big one, landing a kick in my belly and knocking me flying back half a dozen feet. Have it your way. I aim to, I said, picking up a rock as I got to my feet. I flang it at his head and it bounced right off, leaving a lump and a little trail of green blood pouring out of it. And no sooner had I done that then my opponent suddenly chuckled. <laughs> What's so damn funny, I demanded. I'm sorry, but it reminded me of the time Zalabrina threw knee tricks at my head. <laughs> I had just broiled her vorpus, if you can imagine that, and I was about to frummix her maxtamar when she saw her clanch peeking in through the window. <laughs> I thought she would split her grill swan. <laughs> you don't say, I exclaimed, because I didn't need the particulars to follow his story. I do say. That's why I laughed it. Well, it was a risible moment, I agreed. It reminds me of when I was courting a pirate queen named Zenobia, and I proceeded to tell him the whole embarrassing story including what finally became of her clothes and how I got that Z-shaped scar right next to my jugular vein. Uh, I can top that one, he said enthusiastically. And sure enough, he did. And then I told him about the archbishop and the three dancing girls, and he told me about the plorbisht who had three of everything important, and I told him about the weightlifter and the weight with two legs, and after about 15 minutes, we decided that we had so much in common that we couldn't see no need to be enemies. And indeed, we liked each other better than most members of our own races. Damn, I said at last. I wish my pal Hurricane Smith was here. Why? For one thing, he can tell dirty jokes in 34 alien languages. Still, we seem to have done okay without him. I'd call it a successful first context. Definitely. Your race is to be commended for choosing the right hero to confront me. Actually, I'm a substitute hero, I told him. Hurricane's too busy romancing a new lady friend from Driscoll 3. Driscoll 3? He half shouted. What passed for his face lighting up? What about it? The sexiest females in the galaxy are from Driscoll 3. Yeah? He nodded. If you can just ignore what they look like and maybe turn out the lights when you're with them. You don't say. Not only that, he said, lowering his voice to a confidential whisper. But rumor has it that they can actually... Well, once I found out what they could actually, I was as anxious to go there as he was. Bubbles refused to take me, but I wasn't real eager to sit on her hull and fire my laser into her sail halfway across the galaxy, so we hopped onto the Lansterian's ship, and if anyone's looking for a star and sailing ship, I know where you can pick one up for free. And if you're half as good looking as me, it wouldn't hurt to bring a set of earplugs with you. As for me and the Lansterians, we swapped dirty jokes all the way to Driscoll 3, and once we got there, well... By golly, them females could actually do what they were said to do. And on days like that, I feel like the universe is as full of wonders as godless scientists claim it is. Author's Note If Catastrophe Baker and I live long enough, he'll do a riff on every classic science fiction story. I believe his last two were on Tom Godwin's The Cold Equations and Walter Miller's A Canticle for Leibowitz. This one comes from Murray Leinster's retro Hugo winner, First Contact, where two enemy ships meet in space and avoid war when they find the one common thread that runs through their societies.
Welcome back. I hope you've enjoyed the story. I know I did. So the bullfrog grabs onto the person's finger, thumb. Yeah. And awesome. bites it off. And the little audio device is just covered with mucus. Yes. So, hey, any idea how many Catastrophe Baker stories there are? There's a lot. Okay. I would say at least 10 is probably my guess. This is our third one that we've done on here, and he's got several others. Um, so, yeah, as long as folks are still enjoying them, then I think we'll definitely uh, keep on bringing them to you. Hey, hey, about the uh, the cast. Oh, oh, right. After the story, the cast list, right. Um, so the attractive hologram was played by Catherine Pride from Genesis Avalon. And Bubbles was, of course, played by Renee Chambliss. And you can check out links to them in the show notes. The rest of the guys, well... Kind of like last week. Heck of a lot of you and me <laughs> on this one. How did that happen? I, I, did, I did all of the alien voices? Yeah, I guess it was just to keep the uh, accents uh, consistent. <laughs> I, and I doubt they even were. But what, 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 what was the deal? Why didn't Tobias do a voice? I'm not sure why I, I cannot answer that. He did send us a blatant producer plug, though. He says, need a voice for your e-learning presentation? Video, commercial, voicemail system, book narration? Insert random pro voice work here. Anything that needs a voice? Just ask Tobias at TEQ Studios for a quote today. And you can find his uh, link on, in the show notes. He's got a great voice. I mean, we've had him, uh, he narrated The Troop the last time he uh, produced a story, and that was awesome. So, And that was just him. Yeah. So uh, maybe he was tired after that, and so he didn't want to do one of the alien voices. I can't say. I don't know. He didn't say. Well, why didn't you do one of the alien voices? See, usually what we do is we just, we record a scratch track mm -hmm. where we do all the voices, even the, the ladies' voices and such, just so whoever's producing it has that as a base, and they can switch out as people contribute voices. But it's so weird that I would have done them all. I think it's probably because I was the other guy... The rest of the time, you know, I mean, usually we'll have one person who's doing the majority of it. Whoever's talking, the other person will do the other voice. And since I did all the talking aside from those characters, that's probably why you were doing them all. Okay. I thought it sounded great. They were different enough that I thought they worked out well. I really enjoyed the hero's voice from the aliens too. Just that over-the-top, goofy, really loud russian sounding accent that you gave him was very humorous well it was so so much fun to read i i think i had more fun doing this one than the other two it, i mean I, I did get to do uh the Liebowitz voice and all that on the first one and lots of ooh, ah, ooh, and stuff on the second one <laughs> but uh this one just to be able to go <laughs> and the alien words yeah. with the, the anecdotes were like right in the it is floor blats in the crown sneef. Yeah, that was pretty funny stuff. <laughs> Wrecked him. The train killed him. <laughs> Terrible. All right. Yeah. Anyhow, that, that was a blast to do. Each one of these has been fun in a different way, or, or at least for me. And I guess that's why I have a show is to continue to get to do all this fun stuff. Otherwise, your life would just be full of tears and sadness. So it's good that this is here as an outlet. All right, O.T. Thank you. Te tears and sadness. That's usually Mike Resnick's thing. <laughs> That's true. That's funny because I think I was first introduced to Mike Resnick's stories over on Escape Pod because I started listening to that show way back when, like, I don't know, 2006 or something like that. Yeah, he had several stories that were just really touching, you know, the kinds that just made you want to sob, cry into your morning coffee as you're driving to work and listening to your podcast. And uh, it was interesting when, yeah, we, we've got in touch with him and he's like, yeah, here's one. That, and, we, and we got a story that was like that. The first story of his that we did was definitely a tear jerking type story. And then he's like, I also do funny stories. You guys want to funny? Some people like funny stories. Would you like it? And Rich is like, oh, yeah, funny. Yeah, send funny our way. And yeah, we've had fun with him so far. <laughs> we've been really lucky. He's, he's a nice guy. I emailed him that night that we recorded this and told him just how much fun it was. And 
I think he gets a certain sense of satisfaction from whatever emotional reaction a reader has, whether they're they're weeping or whether they're laughing, and that. And I can totally understand that. I mean, it'd be like a a stand up comedian or a singer or something like that, and you just feed on that audience reaction. He did an escape pod episode recently. It was it was so ridiculously sad. There was this girl, <laughs> and she had a serving boy. And she would be so ridiculously mean to this serving boy and tell him to do all this, like, menial, awful stuff. And he would always smile and do whatever she told him to do. And, well, it, uh, to make a long story short, he's murdered by the Dread Pirate Roberts. <laughs> and it was it was just, you know, she, she never really expressed, well, maybe she had expressed. You know, I don't think that was actually Mike Resnick's story, uh, Rish. Oh, really? Yeah. But I, I have vivid memories of it. Yeah, I, I think it was even Sean Penn's ex-wife that played her on that podcast. That's not a video podcast. You wouldn't know that Sean Penn's ex-wife played. Well, I haven't even gotten to the part where Andre the Giant says, Anybody want a peanut? Yeah, that was a good part. I do recall that too. Oh, cool. so you listened to it too. Okay. Mm -hmm. and you killed my father. Prepare to die. Okay, so see, Announcer Man has also listened to that. Yes, it's five. it's a pretty famous story, that one. I was bawling. <laughs> really? It was like a nice mutton lettuce and tomato sandwich when the mutton is nice and perky and oh, so tasty. Get back, witch! I'm not a return your wife without the what you just said. I'm not sure I want to be that anymore. You never had it so good. Inconceivable. See? Yeah, he's seen he's seen it too. Let's just talk about that movie for a little while. I'm not sure what the point of that would be. I think we've already talked about that movie for a little while. Ah. But yeah, we'd like to thank Mike for sending his stories along to us because he's awesome and we can't pay him what he's worth. So we don't pay him at all. <laughs> oh, wait, but we actually do pay we Mike. We do, yeah. But we'd like to be able to. So, hey, donate to the show if you'd like to, folks. Cool. Does that count? Do I not have to do it later? Uh, you have to do it right now again. Say it again. Uh, I second that. Point to the, to the little button, the PayPal button in the corner. That's really good. This is your last chance to listen to the big story before I replace it with my very, very long, overlong, really boring, dull, excruciating, interminable story. Yes. So donate to the show, folks. Uh, good job. Was that a resolution of yours since we're at the end of the year and it's, it's New Year time and all that? You've been making sure to ask for donations every episode. Was that one of your resolutions or that happened much later than last New Year's, huh? Well, it would have happened much later, but you know, I, I don't really make resolutions anymore. Oh, yeah? I, it just – I know I'm not going to keep them. I'm a weak person mm -hmm. and I haven't got somebody there who's saying, hey, you were going to write that Broken Mirror story. You were actually going to win this time and everybody was going to say it was nepotism. You, you were going to win and now you're not. You know, I don't have somebody to prod me and, and say, hey, it's 11.30 in the morning. Why are you sleeping? <laughs> and rather than deal with the recognition that I am a, a lazy turd, I, I try not to make the resolutions at all. Oh, okay. I find myself not doing so much resolutions in January. You know, January 1st, I don't sit down, write up a list. Oh, you did on your birthday. Make a deal. But it, I do have a tendency to feel like I need to when my birthday rolls around. Each year, I'm like, oh, crap. I'm that old now? you got to be kidding me. And I've still done absolutely nothing with my life. Maybe it's time that I actually do the writing that I said I'm going to do. And by this time next year, I'll actually be closer instead of farther from my goal. I will maybe be a better writer instead of a worse writer by the time the year rolls around again. I, I don't know why. I think it's just because of that. The calendar years changing doesn't mean as much to me, it seems, as my life steadily ebbing away seems to mean to me when birthdays roll around. Thank you, RRT. <laughs> uh, well, hey, I, I, I know exactly how you feel. The other day, my mom was watching... The Lifetime Network. And now that always makes me depressed. But a movie was starting and it was just barely starting and the credits were rolling and I was doing something in in and out. But I caught the name of the director and it was a guy that you and I went to school with. Well, he might have even graduated after us. And I, I think I was going to my buddy's house and I got in the car to leave and then I was like, no, I got to go back and look it up on the computer and make sure it's not that guy that we went to school with. So I went in and I looked, oh yeah, yeah, he directed a, f a film and... Uh, and 15 others. No, I... <laughs> well, you know what schadenfreude is, right? 
I believe so, yeah. Where there, There's got to be an, an opposite of schadenfreude where you despair when somebody succeeds. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because that's what I felt. I was just like, oh, I am so worthless. I can't believe it. it uh, he, this guy directed a movie and it has... I can't remember what his name is. I want to say Bruce Davidson or something like that. The guy who played Senator Kelly in the X-Men movies oh. in it. I was just like, oh, geez. And I've accomplished exactly squat. Right. Cold yeah. meat. And anyhow. Yeah, thanks for playing that away, too. Yeah, just just keep it on the loop. <laughs> Might this as well. Episode. This episode seems to be one of those kind of wine fests. You know, Mike has written... If I had to guess, I'd say Mike's written hundreds of stories, if not thousands of stories, because he's an older than us guy, <laughs> and he's been around the block, and he's got wagon loads full of Hugo nominations. So my guess is that he's, you know, he's had quite a career, and he's been successful, and he can look back. And I'd like to know if he ever feels like that. And he's like, oh, geez. I mean, because maybe Mike knew... You know, Orson Scott Card when he was just a young whippersnapper with a really lame beard. And they're making a movie vendors game now, you know, with Harrison friggin Ford in it. Yeah. And he's just like, shoot, Harrison Ford never mumbled his way through one of my stories. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, to me, that is just an intrinsic. That's just an that's just a part of me Uh huh. to always look at the grass on the other side and say, why is my grass yellow? I mean, we got a par, uh, we got a parsec award. We've got a podcast. It's really fun to do. And, and I look forward to doing it every week. And, and I know that there's at least a handful of, okay, at most, a handful of listeners that look forward to it too. But I'm not content with that. I, I, I look at that movie on the Lifetime Network, which I wouldn't be caught dead watching <laughs> anyway. But yeah, he directed it. Uh-huh. Ah, I guess nobody's lived a perfect life and, and nobody has a perfect year or, or, you know, maybe even not even a perfect day. I don't know. Was, have you ever had a perfect day where everything went right? I don't think so. No, I don't think uh, I've had perfectly awful days <laughs> where everything has gone wrong. But I don't think I've ever had a perfect day where everything goes right. And so I guess with somebody like Mike... Surely there were mistakes that, that you've made or, or things that you would do differently if you had to do them over. I would hope that if I had that kind of career, I, well, I, I don't have that kind of talent, though. But, you know, if, if we had Mike here, I would ask him about that. Of, uh, Do you feel like you could have accomplished more? Do you still feel like, oh, geez, there's, there's still eight out of ten things on my to-do list that I haven't yet accomplished? And I don't know. So, so you get to the end of the year and you start to think about things like that. Or at least I do. It's only natural because <laughs> right. the calendar's ending and, and you start to hear that that song. And uh, You mean the Christmas shoes song? <laughs> no, the, the old leg sign. Oh, oh. <laughs> Christmas shoes. Oh, <laughs> you hear dude. the Christmas shoes this time of year endlessly. Oh, so please. I thought no, that I, was... Have we talked about the friggin' Christmas oh, shoes on the air? I don't want to. I don't want to hear anything more about it. Oh. <sighs> Yes, okay, okay, I, I, it I'm, may be the worst Christmas song ever written. It's enough, and we are moving on. So, yeah. If you like the Christmas shoes, don't listen to our podcast anymore. <laughs> I, I, I know we need every listener we can get sans you, okay? <laughs> um, anyhow, I guess just you know, at the end of the year, I, I, I always get melancholy in the winter anyway because it gets so gray and cold as it, frick. It's noon, and it looks like the day is almost over kind of thing. Right. Um, and yeah, I wouldn't last a minute in one of those Alaska or no locations where it's dark for most of the day. The whole winter through, you'd be the guy that is in the uh, psychiatrist's office the entire day through going, yeah, I just, I can't, I can't stop feeling glum. I don't know, it's, you'd be like talking like Woody Allen. All of a sudden you got that accent and you're just like, yeah, it's, uh, that's what my life has been. Terrible food in such small portions. I, I, I don't mean to get off on, on a, a melancholy rant because this story was so much fun. But it's just, uh, I, I don't know, a lot of people get depressed around the holidays too. That, that's true. And I, I think that it's just... I think it's just, because we broke that plate that one time. We fixed it. Oh. Didn't we fix it? Mostly, anyways. 
<laughs> damn plate is just right there. I can see it where we're podcasting right now. And I should I, I don't hate it like I used to hate it. And I'm sure you don't hate it like you used to hate it because you way hated it or we wouldn't have written that story. I mean, now I look at it and I feel a little bit of nostalgia yeah, because I remember <laughs> when she – I, I believe she spent all of your life savings on that plate. <laughs> or it might have been the Christmas bonus and we're like, oh, wow, we're going to be eating until February. And she bought a plate with it. But now I just look at it and I remember the, the homeless guy being dead and the kid <laughs> pointing it out and, and the, uh, the woman on the radio saying, uh, to hell with. No, what did she say? Piss on it. No, what did she say? <laughs> I'm not sure what she enough. said. Enough with this rot. <laughs> and she she just stopped playing the Christmas song. Yeah, she went right into like Metallica's. And now for Metallica's Creeping, Creeping Death. Death. <laughs> That's what it was. Is that woman still on the radio? I haven't heard her if she exists. Uh, she went to a different channel. She hasn't been doing the Christmas uh, channel for a long time. So, Oh, I was so upset when there's a, a station that plays like music you can listen to in the office music that's not going to offend any people because it doesn't have the c word in it and then the week before halloween they switched to the 24 hours of christmas music wow before halloween before halloween was even over it was october interesting yeah just the rage i'd heard that they they used to do it like the very day that halloween was over like November 1st they started, but apparently that's not early enough. It's like all those things, you know, every, all the day after Thanksgiving sales have moved up six hours. So now instead of six in the morning, it's midnight. You have to be there next year. It's going to be the day before Thanksgiving. It's Black Wednesday. Go, everybody. African-American Wednesday. <laughs> yeah, they just can't be happy with what they got. They got to keep moving it up. It's like <laughs> where I work, the <laughs> the morning show used to start at like six and then like the other station moved it up to like 5 30 and so we moved ours up to like 5 25 and then they moved ours up to 5 a.m so we moved ours up to 4 55 uh. well i remember uh they had their news an hour before the other stations had theirs and then somebody got the idea if their news went an hour and five minutes <laughs> People would be tricked into watching that and not switching over to the the other newscasts. And I thought that that was kind of ingenious. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They, uh, I mean, in a mad scientist sort of yeah. way, not in a brilliant sort of way. Definitely. But, but I'm sorry. So we were talking about the Christmas music. Do, does, do they stop abruptly playing the Christmas music the second Christmas is over? Oh, I'm sure they go at least through New Year's Day, and maybe January 2nd. They uh, move on, start okay. playing uh, Perry Como and Mariah Carey and... Chipmunks. No, no, no chipmunks. Explain. Sorry, that, that they go away from the Christmas song by Mariah Carey and Perry Como to the standard songs oh. by Mariah Carey well, I, I, from and uh, Captain and Tennille. Ooh, that's right. <laughs> Sean Cassidy. What sucks is we had missed the very beginning of that recording. So I just had to start from where we started. From a commercial standpoint, do they actually make more money playing Christmas music than they would play in Cyndi Lauper or Joan Jett or whoever it might be? I have no idea. I'm sorry. I... What is the financial benefit to 24 hours of Christmas music in October? <laughs> I don't know. I guess it's for those people who get really excited and like start doing up their houses completely over lighted out with 15 blow up Santas and etc. by November 1st, you know, so they need that music all the end of October to help them get it ready. Well, you know how you resent the people that resent the school having their kids dress up as one of the three wise men or whatever. I resent the hell out of them taking off Phil Collins and Lone Star and <laughs> Napalm Death in place of the fucking chipmunk song. And, and, and Nat King Cole, as great as he is, he has his place. And it's <laughs> the month of friggin' December, okay? And I, I, I'm raising my voice and there are people sleeping. Where do they get off taking away... <laughs> Our secular music about love and surfing and, and, and replacing it with grandma getting run over by a reindeer and, and, and five golden rings. Ugh. I don't know where they get off. It's, it's something that I've just gotten over. I'm afraid I can't bring up the rage and the ire 
maybe it's because this is a regular episode instead of a gets my goat. I'm not. I'm not sure. But are people aware of the that gets my goat episodes? I don't know. Are they? Uh, excuse me, people. Uh, are you aware of that gets my goat? Do you know what that is? M- maybe you should fill them in. Just. Oh no no it's just it's it's whenever we get together we try and do two episodes one episode of that gets my goat where we just are doing what we're doing now we complain <laughs> about something or we talk about something or it's like oh did you see the hobbit trailer you know things like that uh, and then we'll do the oh did you hear the Mike Resnick story an episode of the actual Dune Steve where we talk about that I mean because it used to be that we would just talk about whatever after the story and sometimes I had a difficulty finding a place to fit those in where we talked about something. And it's like, wow, it's a shame we don't have just a podcast where we can talk about the Ender's Game movie with Harrison Ford right, as Ender. But, and, you know, I know that they, they went a little old. They need the, the star power, man. I think Orson Scott Card was trying to uh, make sure Ender remained a child and not go to a teenager, but who would have thought that they would swing that far in the other direction? <laughs> And Dame Judy Dench as Valentine. I, I, I'm, I'm pretty okay with that casting, actually. Well, yeah, I mean, she's a great actress, so you can't complain. But if you want to go over there, I mean, just on our main site on dunesteef.com, there's a, a link to our blog. What is our blog address? Dunesteef.blogspot.com. Right, and, and that gets my goat episodes are there. And, and then they do they also download to people's feeders? Yeah, or? there's also a feed that you can... Uh... You can sign up for and you get them just like a regular podcast. See, I'm the last person left on the earth. Everybody else is is gone. They're all figments of my imagination. No, I'm the last person to adopt iTunes. I just, I still haven't done it. I'm never going to do it. I have to struggle against what everybody else is doing. Okay. Uh, So there is that. If uh, you guys are interested, if you just can't get enough Dune, Steve, there's uh, that getting my goat and uh, it's fun if you like listening to the after story conversation you'd probably like this too it's basically the same thing okay well then i i will stop complaining about the christmas music even though i i don't want to stop oh you know what by the time this episode airs that christmas music will be almost done it'll be over it'll be nothing is over nothing might be close to over anyways it may still be a couple days from being over so do you have any resolutions since we've been talking about that? The years come to an end. You saw a guy who directed a movie and you haven't. Have you made any plans to be better this year than last year or worse? Better or worse would both be an improvement. But yes, yeah, stagnation is kind of where I've settled. Yeah. And that's not good. That's your goal? To remain completely stagnant from no, this year to no, next year? No, no, that's what's inevitably going to happen. <laughs> what I'd like to do is... Yes, yeah, somehow find a muse that, you know, lights me up inside. Because there have been times when you're all excited to write something or all excited to edit something or all excited to do something. And so you don't go to sleep. You stay up an extra hour. You get up when your alarm goes off or in your case, you know, an hour before your alarm goes off kind of thing. And uh, I, I certainly felt that when Kevin Smith gave that why not speech. Now, we mm-hmm. talked about that in several episodes by now, I think. But that just lit a fire under me. It's like, I want to be a why not guy. It's like, yeah, okay, I had this idea. Why not do it? Why not write it? Why not put it on our podcast? Why not? That's fun. Tobias Queen edited this episode. The other day he sent a, an email and he said, hey, uh, I recorded a, a reading of, of a story that you did. Could I put that up on a website? And I was like, why not? And my initial thought is, well, because, you know, nobody ever reads my stories. <laughs> but, but for a brief shining moment, I had something pushing me, which is what I need. You know, somebody just saying, oh, come on, come on, do a little more, work a little harder, pedal just a little, you know, put more, a tiny bit more pressure. What can you accomplish? Think about it. And, and, and that wears off. It wears off for everybody, I think. And so it would be really cool to find something that gave me that Uh, impetus. That Why not feeling again? Yeah. um, I'm going to get you a t-shirt that says why not on it. That's going to be the new Dune Steve shirt. Instead of Chalupa for you, it's just going to say why not. I think I'd get the same thing out of Chalupa for you, though. It just... (laughs) Chalupa for you, Rish. uh, Thank you, announcer man. I'm not sure that it means what he thinks that it means judging by his finger right now, but I'll take it in the best light possible. (laughs) We have a number of things that we've wanted to do 
like on the show and in addition to the show and just for fun and why not? It's, I, maybe maybe I should adopt why not as my 2012 credo. Yeah, that's your resolution, your mantra and your slogan and right. your catchphrase right. and your motto right. and your law right. and your uh, affirmation. Aff- yeah, daily affirmation. Look at yourself in the mirror and say, right. why not? I'm good enough. I'm smart enough. And doggone, doggone it, it, people like me. I'm not sure that any of those things are true, <laughs> but it's hard for me to motivate myself. And it's got to be hard for everybody because entropy is the natural state of the universe. And it's so much easier to just sit there than to do anything. Yeah. So much easier to sit on the couch and just kind of expand into it. Just kind of get fatter until you're just kind of a part of it. And then they have to like cut the ceiling out and airlift you out. Okay, wait, never mind. That's my new resolution. That's what I want. <laughs> That's what you want to do? That is easier, too. So. Okay, well, may- maybe I'll set that as my goal for 2012, to be more of a why not kind of guy. Because there's probably an opportunity for a why not moment in every single day. Yeah. Now, granted, if I don't leave the house for the whole day, maybe there are fewer. But a lot of times I don't. It's true, but not necessarily. I mean, in this day and age... You don't necessarily even have to go places to be doing why not things. And when you're a writer, you do an awful lot by staying at home and doing it. Uh, You know, one time on that uh, I Should Be Writing podcast that Mer Lafferty does, she talked about putting your pants on, I think was what uh, her thing was. Treating it like it's a a real job. Getting up, and instead of just sitting in your pajamas, because, hey, you're a writer, you don't have to go anywhere to write. So you can sit in your pajamas and your slippers with your pants around your ankles, whatever you want to do, but put them on and pretend like you really have a job and this is your job to do and you do it. Hey, why not? Okay, well, let me turn the tables on you. Aha! You have walked into my trap. What kind of resolution do you have for 2012? Well, you, you started bringing up resolutions in the first place. And it made me think of this time last year. Uh-oh. A friend of the show had just decided to set up a, a deal where everybody was supposed to write 25 stories in 12 months. And I think it was the 12 slash 25 group or whatever. And, you know, the idea was that's just a story every other week. That's not so much to ask. It's not too much to ask. And, and we were all like, yeah, we're going to do it and go team. And I think I got three or four of those stories. I don't know how many I got, but that's a long ways from 25 that I pledged to do. And every year when my birthday rolls around, yeah, thanks, Elena I start feeling like I haven't accomplished anything. And I think, okay, it's time to finally get writing on that stuff. And I'll, I'll write a couple of stories. And some of the ones that I wrote this year, I sent them around to a few folks and they read them and said, yeah, I liked it and stuff. And I'm just like, hey, they liked it. Maybe I should write some more. And then they'll like those too. And maybe I could actually go somewhere with this. But maybe I need to get myself a t-shirt that says why not and wear it every single day without washing it. Oh. Wait, wait, was that part of it? <laughs> Sorry, that, uh, that just slipped out. Maybe that's what I need to do is just think, why not? Why not accomplish my dreams? Maybe I just need to prioritize things. I don't know. Sometimes I'll spend hours doing things that are less useful, that aren't getting me anywhere, that aren't heading me towards the things that I dream about, but are instead just keeping me spinning my wheels without going anywhere. I'm not sure what the best way is to do that. You know, one time way back when, and this is probably 10 years ago or more, back when Orson Scott Card was a fairly chubby guy in those days. And uh, then one day, he finally decided to get it together. And I don't know what he did, but he went out and turned himself around and became a healthy and thin person. And he wrote a blog post at this time where he talked about how you manage to do that. He said that you have to word your resolutions correctly. If you just like, okay, in 2012, I'm not going to eat any sugar. Maybe that's what you're trying to do to lose weight is give up sugar. 
but you know you're not going to go the entire year without eating sugar. You're not just going to drop it cold turkey. It's, it's the same kind of thing as smoking or any of those other kind of things, you know. You're not going to be able to just suddenly drop it. It's going to be a process. You know, the second you say, okay, I'm not going to eat any sugar for the year, then a week later you eat sugar and you're like, oh, crap, I blew it. And you're done and you don't try for the rest of the year. Then 2013 comes around, oh, I'm not going to eat any sugar for 2013. And then a week later when you do it the first time, again, you've ruined it and you have to start over the next year. But instead... You know, he was saying that you have to change your resolution. So it's not, I'm not going to eat any sugar for 2012. It's, I'm going to become the kind of person that doesn't eat a lot of sugar. And so then, instead, when you accidentally mess up, well, you don't have to give up. It's not over. You didn't blow it. So maybe that's what I need to do is word my resolution correctly You know, say, I'm going to be the kind of person who wants to write every day or who tries to write every day or who writes every day. Maybe that's too much. I don't know to say that. Maybe then the first time I don't, then I'm like, oh, crap, I didn't do it. So I got to quit until next year. But you did write during a month, right? I did do that. Yeah, that was one of my goals was to write 500 words a day for the entirety of a month. And I actually achieved it. And I managed to write two stories in a month. So I did do the 5225 for one month. <laughs> so there's that. Unfortunately, the other 11 months I totally sucked. But yeah, it's possible. It's kind of funny because, you know, there's like a, a few certain goals that like 99% of the people in the country make every year. And I think one of them is just, you know, be more healthy, lose weight, which is lose weight exercise. Yeah, something I need to do. Stop killing drifters yeah that's the other one those are the three it's funny because the sad thing is that's what i need to do too just like everybody else i've got to make that a priority it's something i've already started working on and i just need to continue with it really well today you said that you took your kids ice skating Mm -hmm. and i was like oh gee that's i want to do that i I haven't ice skated since the 90s (laughs) but because that's something that's fun But it's also exercise. Mm -hmm. I should do that. Plus, my niece has probably never been taken ice skating because her mom is fat. I could take her. I could use the excuse of taking her ice skating to exercise in a way that I don't hate. There you go. Because like in the summer, uh, she and I often ride our bikes around. Cool. Because it's a fun activity, but it's also exercise. Yeah. My kids actually, that's one of the few exercises they will actually You can get them off the couch away from the video game console long enough to actually get them to go ride bikes with you for a while, which is cool. When you said that today, I was like, wow, I'm jealous. I want to do that. How hard would it be? You know, I don't know. And I'll never know because I won't do it. But it would just be neat to (laughs) to do that and have her say, wow, that was really fun. When can we do that again? When can we do that again? So suddenly I have that push that somebody saying kind of thing. And, you know, really all I have to do is get her to do it once and hope that she doesn't, like, crack her head open or something. (laughs) Right. Then she wouldn't be like, when are we going to do it? When are you going to do it? I can't feel my legs. (laughs) So, you know, it's just – I know that one of my chief flaws as a person is that I depend on external stimuli. Mm -hmm. I can't just internally motivate myself. And that's something that probably every human being needs to learn throughout their life is how to get themselves up. Get up, get up, go, move. You know, why not? I don't know. Again, if we had Mike here or somebody who's actually lived a life. Actually achieved something unlike us. Sorry, that's what I meant. He could say, you know, this is how I learned it or or, or it's it's a process that I continually have to deal with. And it's more likely the latter. I hate it when you need to hear somebody say, Oh, I work on that every single day. It's still a struggle, even though I'm an adult now. I hate it when they say, oh, no, that comes easily. I've always been able to do that. No, no <laughs> fuck you. You're never going to accomplish anything. You're maggot food already. I can see. You're never going to fall in love. You're never going to have children. You're going to die by your own hand, and soon. The fortune teller <laughs> that, told me that once. That is tough when people say that. 
I just keep getting that same same thing every time I'll go to like when a writer's in town and speak and I'll be like, hey, and that's what they say. Or, you know, Stephen R. Covey comes to town to give his motivational sp- and that's what he says to me. That is amazing. <laughs> you lent me that uh, Robert Jordan book and he had written it He'd, <laughs> above his signature right there. Yeah. The friggin' Wheel of Time book. <laughs> it's it's huh. uh, unfortunate. Like, I just keep getting that same uh, comment. Despite all the sad music that's played in the show, I am excited about the year to come. And uh, there's some things that I think that could could really go well. I mean, for example, me and you have talked about collaborating on a uh, space opera type story. Mm. And we talked a little bit about it and we batted around some ideas. And the funny thing was on the drive to my house, as we were driving over here, I was thinking about that again. I don't know why it even popped into my head, but I started thinking about, oh yeah, the alien crew member, he could be like this. Oh, and he should be like this. And oh, this would be really interesting if he does this. And this is what his species does. And yeah, I like that. That'll be cool. Hell, maybe we'll podcast that story when we do it. So there may be something fun for you to look forward to uh, as well, the listener. Well, while you're mentioning that, <clears throat> we have the Broken Mirror story event oh, right. going on. And that's something that anybody can participate in. You know, get a chance to express yourself creatively. And there's so many ways that you can do it. No, it's not just writing, but that's something that's my passion and your passion. And so we go back to it again and again and again on this show. You know, that's just, that's part of who we are and part of the way the show is always going to be. Mm-hmm. But but if you'd like to participate in it, you've got probably, I'm not sure when the show is exactly going to come out, but you probably got around 12 to 14 days maybe left. That you could put together a story, and if you write 500 words a day, you could have a 6,000-word story by the uh, time that the uh, time is up. That's plenty long. doesn't even have to be that long. You could do a 3,000-word story, and I'm sure it would be just great. Well, the reason I mentioned that is because you were saying that during the drive, you were thinking of this collaboration that you and I are never going to do together. (laughs) Oh, sorry. Why not? And, and the other day, I was driving and thinking about this broken mirror topic, which is the phone rings in the night. The person on the other end only says one word, but it is enough. Eight is enough. To fill our lives with love. That's what the word they say. You pick it up and they say eight, and you know that it is enough because eight is enough. So you should really talk to your wife about eight being enough because... <laughs> Anyhow, I was thinking about it and, you know, I don't know how the mind works, how it will make these connections because you'll look back and you'll try and figure out how I got from A to F. And you'll find that it was B, C, D, E. But sometimes C and D are missing and you're like, I don't know where that leap came from. Somebody said something on the radio or I passed a sign and it triggered some kind of synaptic response. And then suddenly I was on a different topic and I'd forgotten what I was thinking about. Anyhow, I was driving and I suddenly came up with a way to take that premise and turn it into a story that I would like to tell. Sadly, it's the same story I always tell. But since I don't share my stories with other people, nobody's going to care except you. They'll think it's new. But I was just like, oh, okay, that, that's cool. I, a, a piece appeared in my mind, and it was a major piece of the story. And then I was like, okay. And I don't know how other people write, but this is how I came up with this particular idea. And it's like, okay, well, what could lead up to that piece? And suddenly I had two or three pieces that linked to it. And it's like, okay, then how would the story begin? You know, because I, I started with the phone call and the repercussions of the phone call. And then I was like, okay, what chain of events would have to happen to get to this end, including this phone call or whatever? I got super excited and I was like, oh my gosh, I, I know what I'm going to write. And I pitched it to my cousin. I was going to my cousin's house, which we always do on Tuesday nights. And I got to him and I was like, okay, I, I know we're going to go kill a drifter. But first, here here's an idea I need to get it out there and say it and see if it sounds good spoken aloud. And so I pitched it to him and got to the end and he says, oh, wait, what movie is that? And I was like, oh, no, it's it's not a movie. That's an idea I had for a story. And he's like, oh, it absolutely sucks. It doesn't have kung fu in it, then I'm not interested. (laughs) Who would Abigail Breslin play, really, is what he was saying. And I was just like, wait, why? Why? I I just keep going back to (laughs) it. And this is coming from a guy who didn't hate 
X Men Origins Wolverine too. Everybody else at least has that to say. Ender's Game is going to suck because the writer director did X Men Origins Wolverine, and I, I can't even use that. I, all right, going back, <laughs> kill the Drifter, and he said, oh, "Wow, that's cool." And so I, I was just like, oh, okay, so I'm going to have to write this. And, and it's going to be such a good story and that. And then getting that notebook open and trying to communicate that, you know, story is hard. It's harder True. than just having the inspiration. And, and you know, the, every successful writer, I'm sure if Mike Resnick were in this room, he'd say, where is the door? No, he, but <laughs> yeah, he would say, please untie me and let me go. <laughs> I'm sure he would say that a big part of successful writing is perspiration and a very small part is inspiration Right? because they all say that or the ones that don't absolutely suck and drive me crazy <laughs> say that. Andrew Kevin Walker, I'm looking at you. The difficulty is taking this idea and executing it in a way that the person who reads it gets the same visceral reaction that I got or maybe my cousin got from me telling it in like the barest bones or, you know, when it came into my mind. So it is a new year and I haven't finished this story. I mean, it's probably only halfway done or something like that, but there's a resolution. I am going to enter this broken mirror contest and write the best story that I can. And, and, and in that case, I'll have no regrets at all as far as the broken mirror thing. You know, I, I've, we've done it three times, right? And then you and I have done it Several other several other times, and I've never. Mm -hmm. We've always said, okay, this is the challenge, and and maybe it was months later when I finally handed you my revenge crystal story or whatever it was. But I've done it, so I have a perfect track record. Maybe the stories, the end result, aren't perfect, but I've done it all the time, and mm -hmm. I'm going to continue to do that. That's something that I can actually hold up and say, hey, I achieved that. I didn't direct a movie that's on Lifetime Channel, but I I've written these X number of stories, never retreated from a challenge, so that's cool. Yeah, and you've every single time we've done it, you've also turned your story in first. So there's that. And I think you're going to manage that again. Well, I, I see I'm talking a lot. Have You've not had any ideas on this thing? What, what are you going to do? You are going... Have you ever failed? No. I'm, I'm not talking about in bed. Have you ever failed on one of these broken mirror writing challenges? Oh, you weren't talking about in bed. I remember the very first time that we did it. I just said, hey, why don't we both write a story with this is the premise. I told you the premise. And you're like, oh, that sounds interesting. Okay. And I don't know, a month, two months later, all of a sudden you send me a file. Hey, here's my story on that. And I was like, oh, crap. Now I actually have to write Yeah. It. Oh, I haven't even started mine, but now I have to. And so I finally started it. I haven't failed a broken mirror challenge yet. Although a couple of times it hasn't even actually been a challenge. It's just a coincidence that we both took the same idea and ran with it. Like the last time, for example. But yeah, I haven't failed in that. I've failed in lots of other things. But um, Well, okay. The imaginary Mike Resnick is here in the room. Tied hey. up and begging to be let out through yeah. the door. Oh, Sorry, boy, Mike Resnick. That... We'll treat you better next time. But Sorry. he's here. He's, he probably would say, you know, you need to look at those things that you've done right those few successes that you've had and build on those and not constantly dwell on the many times that you have failed or the many times when you did wimp out or you did just get fatter and sit there and play video games instead of go outside with your kids or the neighbor's kids or that hot blonde exchange student that hangs around your kids. I, I And I don't know. I get, he won't return my phone calls. Mike, please. I need you. I, I need a father. That's some good advice from imaginary Mike Resnick. Actually, I'm not sure how the exchange student fits into that really. That's kind of puzzling. But uh, the rest of it, you know, it, it seems... Like a, a good way to go about it. You know, you focus on what worked and do that more. I wish I could figure out what it was. There's been se several times where I just get motivated and really want to go after it. And I'll write that story. I find I've got an idea and it's in my head and it's, it's, it's a nugget and it's a tumbling around in the polisher. It's rough and not ready it takes a while of tumbling around in the polisher before all of a sudden now it's not a nugget it's a shining gemstone that you you know now it's ready and you know once i've let it percolate or, or tumble in the polisher long enough then i can go with it and i have a hard time having ideas ready one after the other after the other to go like that it seems like if i don't let it tumble enough then i try and ride it and it winds up not making it all the way and then I get a little depressed. 
But to be a good writer, you got to write all the time. You can't just, oh, I don't have an idea that's ready to go yet. I guess I'll just sit here and wait until I do. What can a, a real writer, can a Mike Resnick or a Stephanie Meyer, <laughs> the great, can right. they force that tumbler to go <laughs> faster in their mind and just I put it on overdrive and now I've created this thing that with experience you're like okay and I know how to do that I, I I go for a two mile jog and it will get the blood pumping or whatever I, I you run and I sometimes ride a bike I've found lots of ideas jump into my head when I'm driving or running uh, as long as I can like turn the radio off or, or, or something yeah. and, and you know, you're focusing on the road ahead of you or the exertion or blonde exchange student and, and my mind will go on to writing. Lots of times I've been riding a bike at night to something that I used to like to do in the summer and I'll turn right around and hit the keyboard. Because it's just like, like, why the hell was the keyboard in the road? Damn it. I turned around and hit it. Ah, see what you did there. (laughs) I was just realizing that the other day. You know, I have a long drive to work. I've talked about it several times. And, you know, recently I've been listening to audiobooks like crazy. I, I go through like a book a week. You know, that's cool and all. But I'm not thinking about my stories when I'm doing that. I'm thinking about the story that I'm listening to when I'm doing that. And just the other day, I was just like, yeah, I don't feel like listening to a story today. And so I didn't. And I just sat there. I was actually really irritated about something that someone had said. And I was kind of fuming about that. And then 15 minutes into the drive, I was done fuming about that. And then my mind kind of started wandering. And then I started thinking about some of that stuff. And maybe that's one of the things that I need to do is You know, one time Jay Lake said this in in a a blog post that he did where he just said, I am not a consumer. I don't watch TV. You know, I read some books, but I don't read a lot. I don't see very many movies. I am not a consumer. I'm a producer. You know, it's what I have to do to be a producer. I can't spend my time consuming media. I need to produce it. And maybe that's what I need to do is cut myself off from some of that. It's easy, especially these days. I mean, you got internet right in front of you everywhere you go. I mean, I'm not one of those people, at least, that has a phone that's also connected to the internet all the time. So anywhere I go, whether it be friggin' up camping in the mountains or something, I can still just sit there glued to my connection. But maybe that's what you need to do. Maybe that's what I need to do so that I can let my mind go free and think of those ideas, come up with those stories. Just you talking about the uh, broken mirror story has given me a second idea. I'm not sure how or if I can make it work, but I have kind of one idea that I was going for that I didn't really like that much, but it's what I came up with. And I thought, well, I got to write something and I was going to write that. But maybe I could go a different route with it. This second idea that came into my head when you were talking about your idea. Oh, were you ripping off one of my ideas for once? (laughs) See, it's usually the other way around. (laughs) Maybe I need to go with that idea. I'm not sure how I could make it work. I'd have to do some thinking, make the rock tumble around until it becomes a a polished stone. But, you know, I I realize we haven't talked a lot about Catastrophe Baker. I'm sorry. He does have another uh, Catastrophe Baker story down the line. and, And I promise to talk more about that story and maybe... We can talk about what people liked or didn't like about this one. But, uh, you know, I don't have a lot of really emotional highs or things that go on in my life. Uh, You know, I don't have a great deal of accomplishments, things to be proud of. But one of the best feelings that I ever have is getting to the end of the story and writing those two words, the end. It's just such a feeling of accomplishment of of reaching the end of a journey of, of leveling up in the video game world kind of thing where you're just like wow I did it i did it adrian i made it i did it and <laughs> thank you our t see he's contributing way more than announcer man this episode oh wait ot is the only intelligent one here okay that they're listening to us ramble that may be true but it's just it's such a good feeling and it's something that I forget. I forget how good it feels to reach the end of a story. If the people that are listening are writers, gosh, I hope that you feel that too. Just there's some kind of rush of, 
I don't know. I mean, you are like a you've you've run marathons and stuff. No, no, you have, and you've set goals. I've run five for, Ks, which is, is a that long not a ways from a marathon. But, oh, okay. Well, see, yes. I don't. I'm never going to do any of that stuff. I don't care. You've run and sweated and suffered. I mean, I fudging hate running. It's the baton death march every time. And but yet you've done that not for any purse or any reason other than I'm I've decided I'm going to do it and then you do it and I imagine that even if you're 50th place when you cross that finish line there's a feeling of accomplishment there's a feeling of I did it I, I wasn't actually racing anybody else I was racing my shadow I was racing yeah, myself definitely and anyhow I, I I don't know how this all got into this you know self-motivating kind of thing but I I hope that the people that listen to the show have some kind of goal and that they accomplish it because it is good. I, I'm not one of those. I was going to say I'm not one of those self-centered guys, but of course I am. I did five voices in this, this episode. <laughs> the, the the feeling of doing something and 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 making it and 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 being able to be proud of yourself, you know, making another check on your to-do list, that's really cool. And I, I wish our listeners, our friends, including Mike in the new year to have lots of those feelings of pride and accomplishment and just the joy of reaching a new plateau. Yeah, maybe that's what you need to do is uh, remember that feeling as you're working your way through it. Think, okay, the end is coming and I'll get that feeling. Do you have a, uh, I've heard some writers say that they have like a celebration. Every time they write the end, they have a glass of wine and eat some chocolate or kill a drifter or something i don't know whatever the thing is that they love to do they have that set aside and they can only do that when they write the end and and they're done then they go and they do that thing to celebrate before they move on to the next have you got anything like that or i don't but that's a motivator yeah so maybe that's something could, you could come up with if i could identify something that i really like that's maybe a luxury or maybe that's expensive what were you about to say <laughs> Maybe you should just cruise the neighborhood and find that drifter. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's shift our attention from the drifter to the hot blonde exchange oh, student. Oh, okay. Okay. Sorry. Yeah, that's, a bit that's more positive. Yeah, that's, that's, yeah maybe you just like need to that. figure out something to go along with the feeling. Not only do I get to write the end, but I also get to eat an entire pizza in one sitting or whatever it is that you love. You get to go to the pizza buffet at the restaurant up the street with me as soon as you write the end, but not until then. Boy, it's been years since we went to that. Yeah, we, we need to go again. Well, you better write a darn broken mirror story. There you go. We can go <laughs> twice a month if I can uh, do that 52-25 thing. Okay, hey, I, I uh, we've reached... Uh, there is no way I'm going to get this episode done by... 2012 <laughs> New Year's. but i'm going to try if you're still listening and and you've had a thought of something to help somebody get motivated or just an experience of of how you felt when you actually accomplished a goal share it in the comments or share it on the forums uh, we do have a forum that, and and anybody is welcome everybody i've not i've not seen a single turd <laughs> on the forums everybody has been cool right ryan it's been really cool well, so so share all, all of that and i know that we'll talk about writing again <laughs> it would be neat if we could just draw from that in a future episode and say hey so and so said this and so and so's killed eight drifters and, and now he started to leave a calling card that says i dare you to catch me i mean it's so cool i never even thought of leaving the police a note <laughs> Uh, right. No. <laughs> Let's um, see if R O N O T can have some scary music play every time. Wow, today's show sucks more than one of Rish Outfield's pickup lines. If you've got something that's an inspiration, maybe those of us like me and Rish who need inspiration, who can't self motivate, you know, we could use your comments. Give us a, another why not that could uh, get us going. We we would welcome that for sure. But yeah, thanks for listening, everybody. I think we've uh, run our course and gotten off course and lost our way. But uh, I think our time is also up. So uh, thanks for listening. Thank you, real Mike Resnick and imaginary Mike Resnick in the room <laughs> yeah, for, for giving us another one of the stories. He's a good writer. Now. He is. But it would be really cool to just hang out with him and ask him a couple of these questions to his face. Wait, to his face? It's kind of weird. I'd be like, to the back of his head, you know. Yeah, that um, might be. <laughs> uh, 
And then also Tobias Queen produced this episode. If you would like to produce an episode for us, holy cow, we would appreciate it. The only reason we've had an episode so close to our last episode is because of producers like Tobias. That's right. And Renee and Brian Lincoln and, and Master of Puppets Rich Girardi and Sunny C and... And Sunny D. And yeah, Vinny the Screw and Toby the Narc and Jesse the Phlegmatic. You know, all, all of these guys that we used to hang out in the barrio, man. Oh, they were good guys. Not Jesse so much, though. <clears throat> If you'd like to produce a story for us, basically edit the story, put music to it, sound effects, provided the voices if you'd like, just let us know at editor at doonsteef.com. That's how we're still here. The, uh, besides the donations, which I think we've already asked for, mm, yes. is people donating their time, which in many ways is more valuable than your money. I don't know. We'll, we'll, we'll ask the drifter this time instead of Mike Resnick. <laughs> oh, bye. <laughs> you, sir. Should all acquaintance be forgot? Hey, thanks for listening once again. In the days of Auld Lang Syne. Aww. I'm Bing Anklevich. Wish out feel. See you later. Right. The Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine is published under a Creative Commons Attribution Non Commercial No Derivatives License. This means that you may share these files with anyone, but you may not charge for them or alter them. Good night, folks. Take two. Our special year ender is a look back at all the funny videos that happened on YouTube about reptilian or amphibious animals playing squash the ant on a Kindle fire or an iPad. All right. Are there a great deal of? Oh, there is. Yes. Would, for example, would you would you show me one? Sure. Here you go. Ah. 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 That was the best fire I would have bites his hand. Oh my gosh, I loved that. And I saw them in that order, so I was like, oh, that's awesome. And then you see the bullfrog one, and you're just like, that's rad. Um, so that's what we've got for you today. Get ready, folks. Wait, wait, wait. Is that really oh. what we've got? Oh, that's right. That wasn't what we planned. Oh, save that up just for you. Gross. Welcome to the show. Catastrophe Baker makes first contact. Is that the way you want to read it? <laughs> you sure that's how you want to do it? <laughs> <clears throat> well, except maybe around the nose. And I left him there enumerating all the ways his lady friend hardly resembled a darn. I left him there enumerating. I picked up the ship, told the computer. <laughs> I picked up the ship, told the computer to head to the Leinster system. If you ever come to Branston, too, I'm on the southern continent. We have the most beautiful sunsets. She should probably have a southern accent when it comes down to that. Branston. That's supposed <laughs> to be Missouri. It was interesting because I listened to. Uh, that John Grisham book, The Confession, and the guy who read it, I don't know where he's from exactly, if they say Missouri all the time in that area, or if that's an honest accent or what, but he said Missouri every single time they, <laughs> they had that word in that book. And they had it a lot of times. Various different characters were saying it, and it was always Missouri. I, I killed that woman, buried her in Missouri. Weird. Another guy would be like, yeah. Uh, he says that he killed her and she's buried in Missouri. <laughs> Interesting. Never once did he say Missouri. Well, you don't think that Grisham would have typed it with an A, you know, the way that Stephen King would, you know, tell you how it's supposed to be pronounced in the dialogue. I don't think so. Okay. But you never know. Uh, we have this, the most beautiful sunset sheet. Maybe this say. guy actually did his, uh, like homework and found out what the Ozark accent sounds like. <laughs> well, okay. Of course, he's being paid a hell of a lot more yeah, than we he's are. being paid something, and that's a hell of a lot more. <laughs> yeah, I said. Maybe I'll stop by as a reward. Maybe I'll stop by as a, re as a reward. I gotta say that. 
Maybe I'll stop by as a reward for killing all these alien scum and saving the human race again. Now, man and boy, I've been arrested to... Irresistible. However, <laughs> I didn't read that one right. But I couldn't see where being irresistible to a lady spaceship could lead to anything but a... Dang it. Keep screwing that line up. But I couldn't see where being irresistible to a lady spaceship could be... Damn. Changing narrators. <laughs> But I couldn't see where being irresistible to a lady spaceship could lead to anything but an amusing story or two the next time I was at the outpost. Did I get that all right? <laughs> that's kind of a long bit. And that's only half of the sentence. The whole the sentence whole makes one whole one. paragraph. <laughs> we'll meet on Jenkins. Where the hell's that? I asked. Our seventh planet. Do it. Do it. Oh, that's Bubbles whispering to me. <laughs> Whisp. Do Sorry, I go. Do it. Whispered Bubbles. It's an oxygen. That sucked. Let me do that again. I totally blotched, blotched that one, botched it too. I flang it at his head. I love saying flang. I flang it at his head. I'm just going to say it again. I don't really need to, but I'm going to. I flang it at his head. I had just brightled her vorpus, if you can imagine that. And I was about to frummix her mic stomach when her... <laughs> <laughs> and he told me about the plorbish who had three of everything important. And I told him about the weightlifter and... The weight with two legs. <laughs> No idea what that means, but it's gotta be funny. <laughs> Your race is to be commended for choosing the right hero to confront me. Actually, whoa, that was weird. Actually, Samangela. What did you uh, say? Oh, <laughs> You ruined that gigantically massive bird by talking. <laughs> uh, on that podcasting group on facebook you know what uh -huh. i'm talking about they were talking about i guess november was was it no was november nanorimo or was it october Nan november november was nanorimo and december was like podcastorimo or something like that nanopodmo or something yeah where you were supposed to podcast every single day uh you know an episode or whatever and i was just like wow we could totally do that if we saved like every one of these things a little or you know we sat down and we just chatted Dude, five minute episodes or less and are you receiving texts sting you I, I have to pay for, <laughs> i pay for every one and Enjoy whether i want them or not bill. um but i, I was just saying do things like this is sparta it's, it was him too yeah he's the only person that sends me texts because he doesn't care that i hate him everybody else has a little bit of decency and it's like well my he, decency is now gone prepare for the onslaught but uh, it would just be fun if we had like little tiny things and we could do the whole thing and i was just thinking about that of like you know in february or something of just saying okay you know what if we get x number of donations or whatever we will do that we will spend the month of march and we will podcast every single day It'll be short episodes, and when you really add them all up, it'll be the same as two regular episodes. Do you think we could really do that, though? Manage to cut it to do, down to just like a minute and a half, two minutes for each thing? Oh, certainly, because like the Jonathan Colton one, I could have cut that into four if I had wanted to. And the 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 next one, the, the woman-hating thing, I totally intend to be, at least be three episodes, but it could be four episodes. So we don't need any new... Yeah, I get my goats, because... Uh. Well, no, no, I just uh, say we're set for a long time. It would be fun if we could just do that and we'd have like the what's your favorite Jason Bateman movie and, that, and just little things like that, that we're, we're just punching our clock. You know, we're doing it. You and I sit down and say, OK, we got to do eight of these. What's your first idea? And it's like, OK, let's talk about uh, it's the 10th anniversary of episode two of Star Wars. Let's complain about that. Go. You know, it's like, OK. 
uh, what, what, what do you want to do now? It's like, oh, I saw this commercial, this Lexus commercial, where those people were really, oh, really snotty. And oh, that arrogant. was what I wanted to talk about on That Gets My Goat. You freaking That kidding. was it. There's... <laughs> oh, okay, wait, save it, save it, save it. Let's really do it. Should we do it right now? Okay. So, uh... bless you, sir. Oh, my buttocks hurt. Ooh. All right, welcome back, folks. I hope you enjoyed the story. I'm sorry, what was that? Uh, oh, that. But yeah, he directed it. Uh huh. Ah. Uh, so who was it that did that? It was. One? Oh my gosh. He was a nice guy. He was I a liked, nice guy. I liked, but still, oh my lord, I felt so shitty. When I saw he had directed a movie, and it's the only movie he's directed, okay. came out in two thousand nine. He's not done any since, but I just oh, it bugged yeah, me. Like, Interesting. See, I like that guy too. He was he was a really nice guy, and but I I guess I can see him getting to that point eventually, but uh, I can't see it being anything worth watching. Well, I guess we've got a shitload of uh, outtakes in this episode because <laughs> uh, yeah, this called me. When int- when Ian first sat me down and, and had that meeting with uh-huh. years ago, not not just the recent things with like the, the being paid to write a script and stuff, but uh, Ian introduced me to J- and said, you know, this guy's a really good writer and, and his dick is really, really small so you can laugh at him. And I was like, what? How do you know? And then I realized there was that time. The camp. So Ian had said, hey, you know, if you ever have some work, this guy does really good stuff. And, and I was like, sure, sure. And he did call me. And he said that he had a uh, – he probably didn't call me. He probably had me call and then I had to call three more times before I ever <laughs> got a hold of him. Anyway, he said that uh, he had a job to write a a Christmas movie for the Hallmark Channel. And he says, and I don't know if this is really a, a good fit for you. I don't know if this is your sort of thing. But I got to find somebody to write this and you know, I'm wondering if you're interested. And I thought about it for a, a second and I said, well, you're right. I mean, I'm I'm kind of a horror guy, and I like stuff that they wouldn't show on the Hallmark Channel. But what is the thing? I mean, I I, I I'm I'm hungry. This I will is, write. We're making a movie about the Christmas shoes. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't have been able to do that unless it was a horror movie about the Christmas shoes. <laughs> we should do a pair. Oh gosh, I wish we could just do that. It's like okay, we're gonna take an afternoon. We're gonna do a parody. Of the you know the Christmas shoes and, and that just gets passed along and, and every woman that wears them <laughs> dies and then the story is passed along, but uh, he's like okay well basically it's and, and I wish that I had mentioned it last week I don't know why I didn't I had a mental block but there were like six things I wanted to mention last week and mm-hmm. I didn't but it's it's a it's a, a secret Santa kind of movie I, it's called Secret Santa I believe and. The idea is you're learning about the true meaning of Christmas by doing this this secret Santa, you know, where the secret gift giving kind of thing. And that's that's all it is. They've got a title and that's the one sentence premise kind of thing. Uh-huh. And then he's like, oh, shoot, you know, I got a meeting or I got a call or I just got to hang up on you because I don't like you. Uh, can I talk to you in, a, in an hour or so? And I was like, yeah, sure. Or a half hour. I'll call you right back. Five minutes kind of thing. And it was, ended up being an hour. But in that time. I hadn't told him no, I wouldn't do it, but uh, I thought about it, and I was just like, I can't, I don't have it in me to write a secret a, Santa a, movie, a Hallmark Channel movie. But I thought about it while I was waiting for him to call me back, and when he finally called me back, I said, so, so as we were saying, that's not really my thing. I don't know that I'm the right guy for this job, but if I had to do it, if it were my job, I think I would do it as like a a heist movie. It's like an Ocean's Eleven kind of thing where these people that have got their secret Santas become really super obsessed with it and competitive with it. And each day has to be more outlandish. It's like, and there was absolutely nothing to trace it back to us. And he's like, and we'll do this. And if they do this, we'll do this. And they're planning it out six steps ahead. And it becomes this giant competition of like, they're going to find out who you are. And he's like, no, they won't. And we'll get away with it. Scott free. kind of thing. And anyway, I was getting all excited about it. And he's like, okay, okay. I, I, I've got a couple other people I can call. It's cool. And I remember I was just like, wait, wait, uh, now I'm starting to get excited about this <laughs> no, idea. I want to do it. About the, I didn't the, mean that it's not my thing anymore. 
And I, anyhow, I, that, that was completely blocked out of my mind until you and I talked about Secret Santas in the Asshat Magic Spider hmm. episode. And I was just thinking about that heist idea <laughs> of, you know, this, these guys – planning it all out and having like this outlandish thing where with assistants and people to cause diversions <laughs> did you did you ever read the script that i wrote in high in college called 12 days where it was a 12 days of christmas uh movie that was basically that it was that kind of a thing it was based on that 12 days of christmas thing that i was talking about last week with the whole silver pen and the, having to provide the sample writing and all that kind of crap I had taken that. You had your sister write the... Right. I wrote a script for a a short film like that where it was a bunch of dudes doing... uh, And they, like, worked together so that, like, one person, you know, to to draw attention away from themselves, like, one of them would be talking to her on the phone when the present arrived and stuff like that and all all these different things so that they would take the suspicion off of them and all this kind of stuff and... Have you ever had an idea that somebody didn't steal from you? Because <laughs> I'm sure we wouldn't be sitting here right now if I had gotten that gig and I ripped off your idea and turned it into a well, Hallmark channel. I doubt you ripped movie. it off, but yeah, I, I wrote something similar to that. I think that's funny that you actually had an opportunity to do a film But anyhow, like that. I, I looked at this guy's filmography because he had made a few movies uh, as – like an associate producer or, you know, he, he was on the crew of a, a bunch of movies. And then there was one that was for the Hallmark Channel that was a Christmas movie, but it wasn't called Secret Santa. And, uh, you know, it's funny. I didn't even think to look up the title Secret Santa to see if that movie had been made. But I wondered if that was the same one. And, you know, they had gone on and, and done the movie without me. And why wouldn't they? Of course they would. Yeah. Uh, but it's just one of those things. That, like when I thought about it, I was like, that would have been a cool movie, man. <laughs> <sighs> yeah, people wouldn't have liked it, not on the Hallmark Channel. It needs to be sappy. Yeah, that's the thing. Hallmark Channel is supposed to be inoffensive, and I think its target audience is probably like retirement age all the way up to last breath. Yeah. <laughs> that's their target demographic. It's all like, I'm sure every ad is like, are you having back pain and arthritis? And then the next ad is like, do you need Cialis? The next step, do you need Viagra? I've fallen and I can't get up. It's like everyone is just one of those ads for medication that has a huge list of side effects that could happen. Sorry, um, so back to the show. Before we said I never said Or at least. Right. Not on the real show, you didn't. Not even on the outtakes. He was a nice guy and it's, it's, he deserves to have made it. And, but, and during my drive, I was like, well, obviously the guy paid his dues. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because that's sure my thought. Did. And then I was just like, I don't know that he paid his dues. Nobody pays their dues. Steven <laughs> Spielberg paid his dues, but nobody else pays their dues. They all have a cousin or an uncle that gets them a job or a really, really great set of boobs that gets them the job and all that stuff. It pays their dues. It's a quaint, old fashioned term. Anyhow, but, you know, he probably actually did. Yeah, I wouldn't. But it just depressed the crap out of me. Yeah, it kind of depresses me too to hear that. And I I was just like, oh, geez, that sucks. And uh, I think that was the night that I uh, ended up writing on my broken mirror story until that was the night where you parked the car in the garage and just left the engine running, and they had to take you to the uh, emergency room. I don't know, Rich you. Okay. It's kind of a, of all of our stories, the, the one that it's most like is Invisible Kingdom. Okay. This guy's wife leaves him to go to the Invisible Kingdom because I guess she's not content with life and his, and his penis he tries small. to, and his penis is really small. He tries to carry on and, you know, live his life, and, and but he just can't. He, he loved her and, and she left him and he fills him with this void and eventually he's able to go. To the Invisible Kingdom as well. And his penis is now bigger so that she likes him again? Yeah. Oh, it's it's like a club. <laughs> uh, but uh, he runs into her eventually, and she's put on this persona or whatever. It's like queen of the Invisible Kingdom and all that stuff. And He's got big boozies now? No, no boozies at all. Oh, darn. Oh. Pathalamus. 
Do you want me to say Pthalamus? No. I want you to say Throat Wobbler Mangrove. What's his actual name? It's spelt Raymond Luxury Yacht, but it's pronounced Throat Wobbler Mangrove. But doesn't he say Raymond Yet Luxury Yacht at one point? The first time he says, we've got with us in the studio, Raymond Luxury Yacht. And he says, that's not my name. He says, oh, I'm sorry. Raymond Luxury Yacht. Then he goes, no, no, no. It's spelt Raymond Luxury Yacht. But it's pronounced throat wobbler mangrove. And he says, I, I'm sorry, you're too silly. We're not yes. going forward with this interview. Sorry, you're a very silly person, and I'm not going to interview you. What? It's not even your real nose. It's polystyrene. <laughs> you really do know these things well. Sometimes. That whole, oh, no, no, it's pronounced ferret steam meats. You know, that's one thing. But if you're like ferret steinmetz, no, 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 no. It's spelt ferret steinmetz, but it's actually pronounced chinchilla jubigon. <laughs> jubigon. Sorry. You know, we're rolling. You're going to have to listen through all this crap. I'll save it. We'll put it in our episode. <laughs> <laughs> bum, bum, bum. Bum, bum,